Hello lovelies, in this video we're going to be looking at some exam skills, exam techniques, so specifically how to answer one type of question for your A-level body. We're looking at what a lovely answer would look like for evaluate a conclusion in your A-level. Hi everyone, so we can look at these example of one of these tough A-level style questions where they ask you to evaluate the conclusion when they've given you some data. Before we have a look at the question and go through it, I'm going to give you some tips on how to answer these types of questions when they come up. So first thing you need to do is draw some conclusions. So that means you looking at the data yourself and figuring out what is it telling you? What is the trend? What patterns can you see? So we're talking about correlation here, not causation, because we're never going to be able to definitely link causation even if a statistical test has been done and we've got this idea that there's proof then you're still saying that it's likely that it's there but I would I would always caution against actually talking about causation in your answer the graph shows a positive correlation between x and y because for example so there's your kind of backup your justification points for why if they ask you what bits of the data support the conclusion that's what you're going to say so yes it supports the conclusion because and then you can give some evidence from the data that back up that point. So if they're saying, oh, we expected this drug to increase this factor, then if you can see that there's an increase in that factor because you added the drug in the graph, then that's great. That's part of your yes and supporting point. For these types of answers, we need to say yes and no. So we are going to give yes points to supporting the conclusion and you have to give no points as well, which means that there will be for and against points in both answers. So first of all, look at the data to find your fours and against. So it might be that we've got a conclusion. And then we have a look at, okay, are some of these other factors there in the data? So was a statistical test carried out? If there isn't, then there's no proof of any differences and you can't be 100% certain. So that can be a no point. So no, a statistical test was not carried out. So we can't be sure that this data is going to support this conclusion because the differences or the correlation might not be significant. If they haven't done a stats test, but maybe they've got standard deviation or they've got error bars, on the graph. Again, if they're not overlapping, then there's a chance that there's going to be no significant differences there. So you can use both of those as either a for or against, depending on whether they're present or not. And if they're present, then it gives you support for your conclusion. If they're absent, then they can be reasons why you say you can't be 100% sure that the data is going to support the conclusion. How large are the differences? So if they're claiming a big increase or a big difference, or you need something to be sustained over a long period of time, you want this drug to work for life, or it only works initially, and then the, the kind of difference or the success tails off, then that's clearly something that you can talk about. So is there a big difference? Is it small? Even if there is proof that there, it is significant, is it actually worth taking this drug for the side effects if potentially the difference is quite small? And are those differences maintained long term? So is that sustained, that difference, that effect of whatever drug it might be that you're looking at? Is it one study or have they done it multiple times? Um, if it's not repeated, then you can say you can't necessarily be reliable for that data because it was only done once. Unless the study was incredibly large and there was lots of people in it, which we're going to talk about in a minute. But realistically, no drugs or no kind of clinical trials or anything happen unless there's quite a few studies coming together to show that this effect is consistent and happens in all different types of the population. So then we need to check that any conclusions are valid. So now we're looking more at how the study was done, how the clinical trial or how the data was collected. So not just looking at the data and whether it supports or doesn't support it using statistics and using the actual numbers and the graphs and the charts and the tables, now we're thinking about how did they actually carry out this trial? So what can we be sure of or what can we not be sure of given the information you've been given in the question? So did the study use a large enough sample? Realistically, we're looking at more than 100 people needing to be like quite a large sample here. If it's less than 100 people, if it's a clinical trial on humans or even with mice or something like that, then it's not going to be representative of a whole population. We've used too few subjects to be able to be confident that you can apply these results to a large population or a large audience. Was the study done on a wide range? So it's not just about how many participants were in the trial or how many people were in the trial. It's also about what people did they get in? Was it just men? Was it just women? Was it just patients who had the disease? Did they try it on any healthy people to check for side effects? Was it 
the fact that they used if it, if it's a mice study, for example, then you can only really apply it to mice. It just means that the conclusions you're drawing can only then be applied to this group. Was it a set age group? It might have been a set age group for a reason. But if you're only applying it to an age group of within a certain range, then you can't just apply it to then everybody. Did they rule out other factors? And this is quite hard to predict what the other factors could be. But if you think that there's things that are, could be part of the trial or that could have affected the outcome of the results, it could be other medication that the patients were taking at the same time because they had to. It could be their lifestyle. It could be that they have underlying conditions that weren't checked for. It could be to do with their age. If you think that there's some other factors that could influence the results and they weren't obviously controlled for or checked, then you can say that other factors could have influenced the outcome or could have caused the changes or the differences that you can see. And this often happens in things where it's not been done in a controlled lab environment if you're getting the patients to take their medication at home and no one is checking that they're actually doing it. If you're getting the patients to, as we said, to maybe take other medication at the same time and you aren't allowed to stop that, so they're only taking one, then that could obviously have a factor. There's loads of things you could talk about, but if you think that there's something clearly obvious that could have affected the results, they didn't control for, because they can't, because you can't control for everything, unless you're in a lab and monitoring people 24 hours a day, then you can mention that it could be due to other factors. And literally that statement itself saying the results could be due to other factors, or whether you've been able to identify them or not, can sometimes get you marked here as well. Did they use a control group as a comparison or did they have some form of control? And if they didn't, then you don't really have any really strong supportive evidence that what they were doing is having the effect that they are seeing. So you have, if you didn't see anything where they weren't doing the same treatment or giving the same drug, if there was no placebo used, if there was no something, a uh, treatment done to them that is exactly the same, but without the active ingredient, then you cannot be 100% sure that it's not the active ingredient that's causing that change. And that's part of the problem. So if there's no control group, you can say that. So these are all things, again, you either say yes or no. So yes, if the study was large, that supports it. Yes, if it was done on a wide range of participants, that can support it. But these are all things that I would be looking out for, for reasons why a why you could say the conclusions can't always support the actual answer. Did they use a placebo to rule out any bias? So if a placebo was used, it means that you can use it to compare your answers to, to make sure that it's not just human behaviour. So if people know they're all getting a drug that should be trying to cure something, then they might believe that they will be better or start feeling better or report that they start feeling better because of this idea of they know they're getting a drug that works or should work and that can skew your results whereas if we have a placebo so there's some people that are getting a drug that don't work you can rule out anything that's similar to that placebo group as clearly results that are not valid was self-report used? So this is kind of linked to the placebo effect, but realistically, you're looking at what are they measuring? What are they actually measuring in their output? So are they just asking people if they feel better? I think there was a question not long ago that was about um, depression medication. It's very hard. You have to use maybe surveys or scores or asking people whether they felt better or not and to judge their own wellness or their own improvement. People aren't very good at being objective. And again, if they think they're getting a drug that's working, then they may well start believing that they feel better and then reporting that. So just be mindful about what is it they're measuring? Are they measuring something that's objective? And therefore, you can actually measure it as a score and it's something that the patient ne wouldn't necessarily control themselves. And then lastly, bias. Who is funding this study? Is there anyone, did it, does it claim that this study was done by a company that might have a vested interest in the outcome? So do they want to be able to manufacture this drug and get money from it? Do they want to be able to report that this drug is working or not working? And then that's something that you have to be critical of and think, OK, well, could they have influenced the outcome in some way? All of these are things we can look out for. Some of these things you will get from information from the question. Some of these things you'll get from you could just say if it's missing or glaringly obvious that any of this has not been mentioned in the question, then this is your basis for kind of 
I don't think this data supports the conclusion because, and you can give a couple of these as your kind of response. So let's have a look at a question now, we'll do one together and I'll show you what I mean by this. Okay, so diabetic retinopathy is caused by persistent high blood sugar levels damaging blood vessels that feed the retina. One treatment for retinopathy is to inject medication directly into the eye. That's really what we're going to be looking at. Scientists recently conducted a randomised blind clinical trial of three different drug treatments for retinopathy. They compared their effectiveness at improving visual acuity in diabetic retinopathy patients with medium to high vision loss. Details of the trial were as follows. 666 patients in total, 110 per group. Patients had to be over 18 years of age with type 1 or type 2 diabetes and the average patient age was 65. Patients were grouped according to the extent of their vision loss into high or medium categories based on their visual acuity scores. One eye of each patient was randomly assigned one of the three drugs, Lucentis, Ilia or Avastin. Treatment occurred every four weeks with injections for a year and then every four to 16 weeks during the second year, depending on recommended course of treatment for each drug. At each visit, the patient's visual acuity was checked using a standard Snellen chart of letters held up to six metres away. The following graphs show the results for each group. OK, there is a lot of information here and we've got graphs to look at. So what I would say is read once, highlight as I've done things that you think are important. Then what I'm going to do now is go back and annotate some of those highlight things with things that are going to flag up to me points that we've talked about, whether it's kind of going to be useful to say for or against. So randomised and blind, we know um, or should know from GCC, blind trials obviously try and help to remove bias. It means that the patients don't know if they're getting treatment or not, or the doctors don't know if they're getting treatment or not. So that means it suggests that there is um, uh, work being done to remove an element of bias. 666 patients, which means there's kind of a lot, that seems like a large number. You think, oh, well, that's a lot of patients. That's actually quite a big trial. But if you think about it, 110 per group is quite small-ish. I said over or under 100, under 100 would be a small group. So for each group, so medium or high and with the drug, with each drug, there's only 110. It's not too bad. It still sits on the large side, but it's close to being not particularly large for each drug type. And then we've got patients having to be over 18 years of age, which sounds like a large group, but then you've got them only being able to have type 1 or type 2 diabetes, so they are patients only. And the average patient age was 65, which makes sense if you're looking at something like diabetes, which tends to affect older people. So that sort of narrows down actually who we're looking at here. So it's quite an older group of people, which makes sense because of the disease, but it does mean that we're not actually testing everyone from the age of 18 up to 80 or whatever. They were grouped according to the extent of their vision loss. So they're measuring their visual acuity scores. Basically what happens when you go to have an eye test, we should know what visual acuity is, but it's an objective measurement. So they're kind of giving them a score based on how well they can see letters. And it's the same test every time. They're not going to be able to lie about whether they can see the letters. They'll say what they think and then it'll either be correct or not. One eye of each participant was given a drug. That means technically the other eye is then a control. And we're assuming there's a comparison there. Treatment occurred every four weeks with injections for a year. And so it's clearly a long term study because we go from one year into two years. So that clearly is a long term effect of these drugs. OK, so moving on to looking at the graphs now, we've got the same axes so we can directly compare these two graphs. Very important to always check that. Make sure that if you are directly comparing two graphs, that they do have the same axes. In this case, they do. So it's fine. So I'm immediately looking at all of the error bars that are overlapping in the first graph. So you can see here all the highlighted points where I've looked where those error bars between the three treatments are clearly overlapping, which suggests that there's no differences. There's obviously only three points where the ILEA drug at the top overlaps and a lot for the second ones. And even towards the end, at the very end of the study, there's an overlap there between ILEA and Lucentis. So we're suggesting here that there's not actually that much of a significant difference, especially at the end after a long term trial. Although ILEA is higher and has the greatest mean change for the whole trial, it seems. Actually, if you look at where the error bars are overlapping, it's not consistently higher than Lucentis because there is overlap there. And realistically, Avastin and Lucentis are effectively the same. There's so much overlap there. And actually, at the end, uh, you've got it shown that it's actually quite low towards the bottom. So looking at the second graph, which is for the high vision loss patient group, there's no overlaps at any point with Ilia and all of the other drugs. 
And there's definitely a clearly bigger difference between the three towards the end, with obviously Alia having the most significant mean change. And you've still got those kind of overlaps a lot between the other two drugs. But on the long term, it does look like we end up with Lucentis being kind of having a significant difference than Avastin in the long term. But they've got a lot of overlaps at the start. So what we've concluded from these results is that uh, the change in terms of the mean change in visual acuity is greater in the high vision loss patient group than it is in the medium vision loss patient group. And that ILEA has a significant or more likely a significant difference in increase, a significant increase in change than the other two drugs. And that realistically, the other two drugs are kind of not really distinguishable from each other in their differences, but definitely that we've got an increase in the high vision loss group compared to the medium vision loss group. So now let's have a look at the question that it's going to ask us, which is going to be evaluate this conclusion. We'll see what the conclusion is. And then we basically put all these points together as some for and some against points. OK, so the scientists concluded that ILEA was the most effective and could be used in the majority of retinopathy cases. Evaluate whether the data supports this conclusion. So basically it's saying that the ILEA drug was most effective, but it's the word majority here that's important. It suggests that in all patients that have diabetic retinopathy, that it's best to give them ILEA. Now, it's clearly not true and not the case here because we've spoken about the fact that there's clearly a bigger difference or more of a pronounced difference in the most effective drug, but only in those with high vision loss. So that's already uh, against flag that we can say, but we've got to obviously back up, back up our conclusions with that. And we can need to put for and against. So there's some things about the study that are good and suggests that obviously ILEA does seem to perform better than the other two drugs across both trials and across the long term. Obviously, and it was a large study, and we assume that there was this control with the, the single eye that wasn't used. But we know that there's from the sort of the error bars that we've seen and the overlaps that, and the sort of only small differences seen in the medium vision loss group that actually it's not going to be best for the majority and that's where our kind of key against points are going to be made so yes i did show the highest increase in visual acuity score in both if, if you just discount the error bars for a second and you think okay why do they pick this drug as the best well because it did give the greatest mean change or highest increase or highest change increase across both and it was the one that was at the top and it showed this kind of steady increase that was maintained over the long term. It was a large study and the trial was blind to remove bias and there was a control, only one eye was treated. So we assume this mean change is like they test both eyes separately every time and it's the difference or the increase in the visual acuity of the eye that's been treated. Okay, so let's think about our against points. Only patients were treated, so only people with the disease were treated, and it was quite a narrow age range, so it's mostly on older people. No statistical tests were done. Ouch! This is why in some videos I have unexplained scratches. Thank you.